How you doing? Very good, good, great. Good, good morning. My name's Andrew, as Don mentioned before. Oh man, it's good to it's good to be here. Um, lots of faces I don't know, right? which is so I expect so because I'm, I was here well, in 2016. So that's you, exp- yeah. So and there's been a few church plants since, but good to see a few faces that I do know. But great to see that God has is bringing more people here so to to really meet Him in in this place. Um, if you don't know me, I'm at North City Lake, North Adelaide. Those those guys up there. Um, and yeah, I used to be here before planning out. Um, Don asked me to preach a few weeks back, and I thought to myself, why why would I? Why would I torture myself doing that? No, no I'm just kidding. Um, it's really my honor and privilege to uh, opening up God's Word today. I have a great fondness for this church, and it's good to be just you know, back at the old stomping ground, right? Um, if you're new here as well, or if, you're, if you aren't a Christian, or you're not sure about faith or whatever, let me add my welcome to you. Um, I hope that you feel welcomed here as God has welcomed all of us. And um, my prayer is that you get to meet Him through our, the scriptures that we're reading today. Um, So, my understanding is that you are in the tail end of a sermon series looking at small books of the Bible um, in the New Testament, and today is no different. We're looking at 3 John, 3 John, 3 John. Um, It's really short, it's 15 15 verses, Um, but before we get into the text today, before we dive in, I just want to do a quick poll. Um, How many of us have ever, ever received mail that doesn't belong to us? Oh, yes. Man, Australia Post got a little slacking, right? Um, and now, without looking around, how many of us have had the urge to open up that mail? Okay, so it's not just, not just me then. No, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that you have opened it. I'm just saying the urge, right? Um, I'm like, technically, it is a criminal offense to open up someone's mail. I didn't actually know that, but I haven't done it yet. Um, but true story, I've been getting this guy's mail for two years now. Um, and um, it's from a bank, <laughs> and um, truthfully, I've been really tempted to open it. Um, clearly, he doesn't, he doesn't miss him, right? Um, and, but I'm just kind of curious, like, what kind of a guy leaves the home and for two years is still, like, getting his bank statement sent to me and hasn't looked at it? So I'm just thinking, like, well, if I, if I was to hypothetically open one up, I'd, I could probably read through the lines a little bit and make and see through his bank statement. What kind of a, what kind of a person is this kind of guy, right? And that, that's the kind of same same kind of deal when you're dealing with three John. When you read it, there are some things we don't fully know. You have to kind of read in between the lines a little bit, uh, to, to, and you have to read in between the lines to kind of kind of build the scenario. And this applies to. A lot of the letters that you read in the Bible, but especially 3 John, because it's not addressed to a church, but it's addressed to a person. It's an an individual. Uh, What might also be helpful when we unpack 3 John together today is that you have to get into the the mindset of the receiver here when you're you're reading this mail. So, uh, So before we understand how this personal letter kind of applies to us, we kind of have to get our heads around like the idea of who's it from, Who's it to? Where's it going to? Who are these characters in this letter? What are these events or things they're talking about? And what, can we, what kind of things can we deduce from this letter? Um, and so if you have your Bibles open, um, I'd like you to keep them open at John 3. No, three, no sorry, 3 John. John 3 is completely different. 3 John. Um, if you don't have it, it's on the screen. Let's, let's rip open this letter, and I'm going to read it for us, right? 3 John says this. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a beautiful thing, it is a faithful thing uh, you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send, send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for, for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, 
I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to, who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I, would, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. Why don't I pray and see what God has for us today. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living, breathing, and active. Um, we thank you that it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Lord, as we encounter this text, help us to encounter you. Spirit, I pray that as we open up your passage today, do a work within us, soften our hearts, open our eyes, unstick our deaf ears, reveal the blind spots in our lives, and help us to become more like Christ. God, I pray that you, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We all pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, you might be wondering, what does this personal memo have to do with my life? Now that we've kind of ripped open this letter, it sounds like the, this letter is just airing the church's dirty laundry, right? Before opening this passage up, I just want to set the scene for a sec. There's some background here that you kind of need to know to kind of get a feel for the text. So I want you to cast your minds back to the first century AD for context. So first century, so you have the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ around 33 AD, right? And so Christianity then explodes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, to Rome, and across the Roman Empire. And these Christian communities kind of start popping up, founded by these apostles. And then you have this Johannine community kind of pops up. And amongst the persecution of the Roman Empire, you also have these false teachings about Jesus, and they're making the rounds in the church and infecting the church. Now, I want you to have all this in mind when we're unpacking this text this morning. So verse 1 goes like this. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Straight off, we could see it's from the elder. We might have, if you guys looked at John last week, um, one of John's letters, the elder is, is John. We can deduce uh, from the other apostles, from John's other letters, that this is actually the apostle John. And it was probably written about late, late first century, late 90s ish AD. Um, and John's letters were likely written to the churches in and around Ephesus. Um, in the Roman province of Asia, but that's the mod that's around the, the western kind of part, western coast of modern-day Turkey. Um, li likely, three John was written to, to the, at the same time as the other um, letters of John because they have pretty similar themes. You can also see that John is writing to a guy named Gaius. It's unlike one and one and two John though, because, I guess I said before, it's written to a particular person, not a, not a group of people. It's a personal letter. I'm sure you've had text messages or um, emails that have been just uh, have been actually longer than this one, really. But you get the sense from this letter that Gaius is some sort of kind of like influencer or leader in the church. Uh, but honestly, we don't know much else about him. We don't know much else. We know that Gaius is a common name in the like Greco-Roman world, but it's probably not the Gaius that we hear in Acts. It's just some dude. Also, notice the relationship between John and Gaius here. John may be, probably, is probably some sort of leader to Gaius because he's the elder, but notice how John calls him the beloved. The NIV renders it as a dear friend. It's not only that, but the basis of their love and their friendship, it's not because they support Sam Kerr and the Matildas. It's not because they enjoy fishing. What's the basis of the relationship? What? It's, it's in the truth. Their relationship is in the truth. Now, if you know anything about John's writings, he, John is obsessed. He's obsessed with what is true. 
that makes sense, considering that John was f- writing to fight and the, the proclamation of the truth in his other letters. He uses the term the truth a lot. And depending on what context, it generally means faith, to have faith in Jesus. But overall, it really what it means is whatever is real. What is reality? And the thing about the truth is since it is, it is real, it has implications. The facts have implications and they must be acted on. As we keep breaking down this letter though, you will see how John leans on this idea of the truth. Let's keep going. Verse 2. It says here, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Here you again, you see John's affection for guys. Beloved. But guys, you can also see here that guys is doing something right. He's doing something right here. John's already heard that guys is doing spiritually well and he's praying that guys' physical health will go well as well. This is just a small caveat. I don't want to spend time on this. But this text is not saying that we just claim this passage that God wants us to be healthy and happy. Literally, this, what, what's literally happening in this letter is John is saying, you know, hey, I hope you're doing physically well because I heard you're doing spiritually well, man. That's what he's saying. Rather, in verse 3 and 4, it makes it really clear why Gaius is doing well in his faith. Verses 3 to 4 say this. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, testifying to your truth here, the words there, means it's not talking about your truth like we think of as in our time, like, you know, Oprah, speak your truth kind of deal, truth is relative. It's not that at all. Rather, the, I think the NIV rendering I should probably just read the NIV, right? Um, rather, the NIV rendering is really nice. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's nicer because it says, it's testified to the, your faithfulness to the truth. Presumably, John has heard about Gaius' faithfulness, faithfulness to the gospel message. But this faithfulness is not just some mere intellectual adherence to a message. No, friends. John is not saying, you recite all the right doctrine and that warms the cockles of my heart. No, that's not what he's saying at all. Rather, why is John super chuffed? Because he's heard that from other Christians that Gaius is continuing to live out his faith. He's not just idly sitting in his faith. He's walking in the truth. He's walking in the truth. Faith isn't merely just lip service for Gaius, but it's moved from his head to his heart to his hands. And this opening few lines of his letter really sets up the tone for John's main exhortation. In verses 5 to 8, reads this, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do, in all your efforts to, for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, and we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now, we don't exactly know what the specifics of this quote-unquote faithful thing is referring to, but whatever it is, we know that Gaius' motivation was love. His motivation was love. That's why he did it. So who's the recipients of these faithful acts, these, these faithful things? It's love. Well, it's the brothers, as strangers as they are. They're, the peop- they're people of faith, but they're unknown to Gaius. Verse 6 tells us these brothers are being sent out on a journey. Verse 7 tells us they've gone out for the sake of the name. So it's very possible that these guys were some sort of itinerant preachers or evangelists. Now, this makes sense when you consider John's other letters. He talks about um, the false teachings that were being spread around in the church. There was fake news about Jesus not being really human. There were some other goofy, whack, and like hoo-ha, Gnostic heresies out there. And it's entirely plausible that John had sent out these preachers to correct this. But even if that was not the case... Even if that wasn't the case, these itinerant preachers, these evangelists, would have needed a place to stay. They would have needed food, shelter, money, maybe even clothing. 
And for the sake of the gospel message, when, they pre- when these itinerant preachers preached, they didn't take a dime from Gentiles because they, w- they, did not want them to, they did not want that to hinder their message. It's no wonder that John encourages guys to send them on the journey that is wor- in a manner worthy of God. These brothers were living off the generosity of the church because they materially had nothing. Nothing. We see that John has heard of guys doing something like this already, and he's doing it for Christians that he doesn't even know. Put yourself in guys' shoes for a sec. Can you imagine inviting another Christian who you have no idea, you've never met this person before? You welcome into the, you, you welcome them into your home. You feed them a nice meal. You let them sleep in your bed and you sleep on the floor. And then you send them off with a portion of the little money that you've been saving. That's what, that's what guys' love probably looked like. That's what it probably looked like. John's exhortation to guys here is to continue to honor these guys by being supportive and generous to them. And tells them by, by doing so, when you, when you do this, guys, they, you are taking part in the mission of proclaiming the kingdom of God. But sadly, as much as there is much encouragement for guys here, for his generosity and hospitality, not all is actually well in his church. We find that out in verses 9 and 10. It says this, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to want to and puts them out of the church. Again, we don't know about good old Diotrephes. We don't know anything about him. Other than he's probably some guy with some sort of influence and leadership, some sort of power in the church. And according to John, Diotrephes is a bit difficult to deal with. He's putting himself first. He's dismissing and ragging out John the Elder. And on top of that, he's not hospitable to these traveling ministry workers. And then on top of that, he kicks out people in his own church who want to support these guys. Now, we don't know what the motivations of Diotrephes were. Although those there were her- heresies being touted out about in the Johannine community, you would have expected if that if this guy was a heretic, John would have said something to correct it, right? One theory is that Diotrephes was actually vying for power and didn't like to be under the authority of the apostle John. Another theory says that the bad blood between John and Diotrephes could have been just, like, you know, just some, some miscommunication. But nevertheless, regardless of the reason, is this how a Christian is meant to behave? Throwing out the brothers? Throwing out your, your, your own church folk? That doesn't sound very Christ-like at all. Especially when you consider Christ, he proclaimed the kingdom of God being the first will be last and the last will be first. John's probably thinking, dude, why are you acting a fool? Like, this is, we're on the same team, bro. It's no wonder John says what he says in verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil but imitate good. The difference between Gaius and Diotrephes could be not any more stark here. Clearly, John is contrasting for Gaius what to do and not to do here. However, it is tempting when we read this particular verse, all we see is a command to Gaius, and thus a command to us, like, just to do good. I mean, that sounds pretty simple, right? Just, just, just do good, don't do evil. That's... that's that's it. Just do that. Easy peasy, living squeezy. That's Christianity, right? But you might be wondering, hold up. Christianity isn't the only religion that says that. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Muslims say that. I'm pretty sure Hindus and Buddhists would say that. I'm pretty sure, heck, even atheists, agnostics, and human, secular humanists would say that, right? Psst, big deal. Do good. Don't do evil. Not only, but is that what we're meant to get out of this? Not only that, if we were to just take it as as that command, simply as that command alone, would it just leave it as some sort of moralistic, legalistic teaching? Well, the second half of this verse actually really clears this up for us. It says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. The important part here. Whoever does good is, what? 
from God. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Now, on face value, the, the, the first, the, this half of verse 11 can be a bit confusing. Whoever does good is from God? Are you saying, Tran, are you saying, Andrew, that if you're a good enough person, that God just approves of you? That's what, that's what it sounds like to me, right? Well, not, not actually. When you, read, when you read this, you kind of have to keep in mind that in, it's one of those scenarios that all Christians must do good but not all who do good are Christians. You, you feel me? Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Like, all Christians must do good, but not all people who do good are Christians. If you're a Christian here today, and you don't know, um, and you know that you don't, you, if you're a Christian here today, you know that your standing with God is not based on how good you are. It's not based on how good your actions or your deeds. The righteous stand that you have with God is afforded to you by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right? That's it. It's not by what you do, it's by what Jesus has done on your behalf. He lived the life that you couldn't. He died the death that you owed. He was raised to life, from, from death to life so that you too will be raised from death to life. He's given you perfect standing before God. There's nothing you can do to change that. Right? It doesn't matter how good you are. There's nothing that can change that unshakable truth. But just because someone claims, just because we might claim to be Christians, and I'm not saying this is for all of us, maybe some of us here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are one. Just because you might have grown up in a Christian home, you've just gone to church all your life, and that's what you've really known, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily a Christian. To see that if you are really a Christian, one of the markers that you must be marked by is, quote unquote, by doing good. It's kind of like, I, don't know, I work as a physiotherapist, and I have, an ex- I, I, when I, someone comes to see me, I see a patient, I have subjective examination and objective examination. Subjective is when they come in, they're talking about your problems, and they say, for example, like, tell me what's your problem? Oh, I have tennis elbow. Excuse me, I'm like, okay, good. How do, you, how do you know that? They often tell me Google. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. I didn't know Google was handing out PhDs, but that's fine. Um, I'll ask a bunch of questions, and then I get to the objective stuff. They think they have tennis elbow, and I do some more objective testing. I check the range, I check the grip strength, I check repetitive movements, I load the muscles in different positions, palpate their tissues, check, check for tenderness, that kind of stuff. And if we absolutely need a confirm- confirmatory diagnosis, we get an ultrasound and they get like something that says, or a report that says they have lateral epicondylitis. Like that's, that's the gold standard diagnosis. Like, right? But I do these tests to objectively find out if they have something they claim to have, to claim to be. Now, I'm not sure if you read 1 John, if you haven't, that's a banger of a letter, definitely get into it. But when John says, whoever does good is from God, he's riffing from 1 John here. It's a different letter. And it's like, he uses this language quite a bit. But this language of being from God is this objective marker that indicates that you are, hey, are born again Christian. John calls Christians these, with these markers of goodness as people from God, as people who have seen God. John Stott puts it this way, to do good is to give evidence of divine birth. So the whole point of verse 11 here is to encourage Gaius and by proxy us that because Jesus has saved you from your sin and that Jesus has now reconciled you to God, you are now to give evidence of your salvation by being like Him, by doing good. And this, is, this good is in particular, in particular, is to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then John, to, to, to really ram this home, John gives us another example in verse 12. It says, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And also, we also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Once again, we don't know who Demetrius is. He might, it's, there's some speculation as to he might have been like a messenger with the letter and stuff. But regardless of whoever he is, we have John commending Gaius, this Demetrius character, who presumably is unknown to him, not on the basis because he claimed to be a Christian, but why? Because his life proves so. 
This was proved through the testimony of other people. This was proved through his actions. This was proved through John's own testimony about him. John saying, this guy is trustworthy. Be solid. Be like this guy. And then John finally wraps up his personal note in verses 13 to 15. It says this, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. You can hear the, the urgency in John's, in John's voice here as he longs to be with him. And it's, and it's not only John, but it's the, it's the friends. Again, we don't know who these guys are either, but the friends are greeting him. And he's asking to greet guys as friends. How? Each individually by name. This speaks to the sincerity of the love that Gaius has for the Christian, uh, speaks to the sincerity of John's love for Gaius and the Christian community. It's not some mere generic kind of like passing over like, oh, I just love you guys. I have this affinity for you. No, I, I love each and every one of you individually. It's genuine. It's heartfelt. It's, it's personal and long. It's a personal longing. Now, now that we've come to the end of this personal note from John to guys, now what, what, what do we do with it? Well, I'm going to leave you with two kind of applications here. Um, kind of like a minor one and a major one. The first one... The minor one is kind of like support the mission. Um, I think it's pretty obvious from, from well, for the last really 2,000 years that with, for the church to go ahead, for the mission to go forward, it needs resources. Yes, God will provide for his mission. God will complete his mission. Christ said that he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, right? But God has invited us. No, no he's not invited us. He's enlisted us to be part of his mission. And he's given us the agency to choose and contribute what is needed. It's through our choices, through us, God will complete his mission. That's nuts. Like, plan A is Jesus comes and saves the world. Then he spreads his kingdom. How? Through us. Look around. Just, just look around. Like, we're it. We're plan A. There is no plan B. This is it. <laughs> like, we're not, we, we might not be like Christians in the first century when you have missionaries come to our doorstep and they sleep on our beds and we give them food. I mean, maybe, maybe you do. If that, if that is you, fantastic. But we certainly all have the capacity to resource the proclamation and the spreading of the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to. Now, if you're, if you're new here, and or, and or if you've had like a poor church experience, um, you might be thinking, man, is he going to talk about money now? Like this is, this is what classic church, this is what they always do, they always talk about money. And I've got to hand it to you, I'm not going to lie. Like in an oversimplified, really reductionistic kind of way, yes, God loves, wants your money. God really wants your money and, th and there's a good reason for that. Uh, there are many ways you could resource the, resource the mission of the global church. One way is through this church in particular. When you tithe to this church, yes, it goes to the gospel workers and the, and, and the building up of the saints. But a small chunk of it also goes to something like Acts 29, the church, the church planning network they were a part of. And that goes towards church planning efforts. And right now, I think they're going towards Japan. Is that right? For some of them in Japan? Asia Pacific. Yep. Or you could give towards Open Doors. Open Doors exists to support the most persecuted Christians in the world by supporting pastors and supporting discipleship training, paying for Bibles and providing socioeconomic support. Or you could partner with Compassion. With the ch with this, I know this church partners with Compassion to support kids in the Philippines, to support churches in the Philippines, to support those kids, not to help them lift them out of poverty, but to lift them out of spiritual poverty. Or you could even help with Green Team. I'm like, I'm sure Don didn't actually mean for me to preach about this when we were, like, when we were talking about Green Team stuff before. But this is something that you could also contribute to as well. It takes $1,500 to provide for engagement opportunities for the gospel. But you could also financially vol um, support volunteers who are going down to that weekend. I could go on and on and on and on. Yes, God wants your money. But if you think that all that, if your money is all that God deserves, you might want to think about that again. Yes, I can see that for some of us, you know, times are tough. 
You look at the inflation rate, CPI is at 6%, 6%. Economics, macroeconomics aren't looking fantastic. But let's be honest here. The majority of us, if I look around, the majority of us live in middle to upper middle class lives. And giving money is a, today is a mild to moderate inconvenience. To support the mission, God, yes, wants your money. But probably as importantly, if maybe not, if more importantly, God wants your time. God wants your time. Uh, crickets. <laughs> now, I'm aware that we are in a time-poor culture. And before you say, I don't have time for that, Tran, I'd like to give you a friendly challenge. I'm not, call- I'm not calling you out. I'm not like, trying to guilt trip people. I just want, I, I, and this is, applies to me too. We're all in the same boat, people. Go to your phone. Check your screen time for the week. Just, just check that. So, go home. And think about how many times you laid on that couch and binge-watched Stranger Things for the fourth time or something like that, right? How much time do we spend on our overindulgences? How much time are we spending on trivial pursuits that have no real kind of meaningful purpose? How much time are we using to, to disguise those things as like, of critical importance. Oh, this is really important. This is really important. But really, at the end of the day, it doesn't make much of a difference at all. And again, I'm not calling anyone out. This applies to me too. This really applies to me too. And like writing this sermon to prove that I procrastinate way too much. (laughs) But this leads on to my next point in our text, uh, my next application here. And it's to love God's people. God wants your time and that can be expressed in loving God's people. Now, this application sounds really straightforward, sounds really obvious. And although it is encouraged strongly by John, almost as like a command, loving God's people is meant to be an expression or an overflow of where we are now in Jesus. Remember John's relationship with guys in verse 1? It's based on them being both rooted in the truth. As Christians, especially if you belong to a local body like this, our tendency is to relate to people that look like us. We connect with people and love people who do similar things to us, who have the same interests as us. And to be fair, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if our relationships in this local body here, in the body of Christ, are only based on that and not ultimately on Jesus as the foundation, you might as well just go to F45. Or like a sporting club or something, right? Or a yacht club, if you're that inclined. Again, like guys, we need to walk in the truth. Yes, we need to absolutely love God with all our mind and heart. And as intellectual as Christianity is, it is deeply and spiritually intimate. Faith is dead without works. Christianity is an actionable faith. Love is something that you don't just merely feel, but it's something that must be done to others. And remember how Gaius served and loved Christian strangers? How much more should we love and serve our brothers and sisters that we see here week in and out? He was serving strangers. It's ironic that John finishes his letter, greet the friends each by name. How many people do we know here by name? And I, I say this because I've been in like Australian church, like white people church for like the last seven, eight years now. And I know that like, actually, actually this goes for actually churches all across, all, all, all ethnicities, ethnicities really. But um, how, how, how much do we not know people by name sometimes? We see them week in, week out. We don't even recognize them. So ask yourself, like, what would it look like for you? No, no, no. What would it look like for us? What would it look like for us to love each other? Not like with just platitudes, but deeply, tangibly, practically. And the only way to do that is if we, if we know each other, right? I'm not saying that you have to be best buddies with everyone at church. No, I'm not saying that at all. It's not, that's not actually feasible. And I'm not trying to heap that onto you. you don't, again, you, your salvation with God, your, your standing with God, it's, it's purely because of that, because of, because of Jesus. But this is an outflow of that. 
But if we were to tangibly love Christians that God has just put in our immediate setting, what would that, what would that look like? What would that look like, friends? I'm confident that it's be more than just the Adelaidean, you know, niceties and you know, talk about the weather and stuff. But one of the ways you, do, you could do this is through discipleship group. By participating in discipleship group, you, you, your lives kind of, kind of come together where iron sharpens iron. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is what it comes down to the posture of your heart. It really does come down to the posture of your heart. And as Christians, our hearts and minds are being radically transformed by Jesus every day. We need to put ourselves, the old self is dead, and we need to put on the new self. Now, what I'm saying here is probably not revolutionary to most of us here. But I also know that um, we'd all love this love to be just natural and just come easy. But we have to, we have to work at it. Like, if, it was, if it was natural, and, like, put it this way. I've been married for like two years now. And if I was to not try, and it's just like, oh, I just want to be my authentic self and just let it happen, I don't think I would have much of a marriage. That's right. I have to actually work at my marriage. And the same thing, that's the same thing with our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ here at church. You know, people are hard. We all have problems. Some of us are really awkward. I'm awkward. <laughs> um, but you know what? It's, uh, it's, in all seriousness, it's going to take a lot of effort to love people meaningfully, and it might cost you. Um, some of us, might, like if we've been in church for a while, we feel like, man, I, I feel depleted. I, def- I, feel, I feel burnt by the church. I just want to be confident and stick to my own self, you know? And I understand that ten- ten- tendency. I totally understand that. But as natural as it is to stick to ourselves, God doesn't want us to lean into something that's just natural. God wants us to lean into Christ. Like He wants us to lean into Christ. Like God loved us so much that He gave His Son for us. And since now that we have the greatest gift in the world, the greatest love in the world, we can love others like that. And this isn't a message to say that just get over yourself and love the stranger. No, when we walk in the truth, when we know we belong to God, it is only out of that place that we can love his people. We love because he first loved us. Christ is the starting point and the only starting point for this. So, as we finish up with God's word today, let us consider not just who to love here or how to love people here or consider how much it will cost to love God's people, but really, Lord, let's consider Let's consider, friends, that we have been loved so lavishly by the Father. And by that, we can love others. Let's pray and and, um, ask that God help us with that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your Son. We thank you for, man, we we just thank you that he is the, the visible image of the invisible God. We know that when we see him and know him, we get to see and know you, Father. Father, impress on us what it means to be loved by Jesus. Impress on us the, how high, how wide, how deep your love is for us through him. And may that impression transform us to be like him. Spirit, I pray you do a work in us. I pray that you help us overcome our selfishness or our selfish indulgences. And we, uh, Father, we, at times we have walked in a way that is not according to the truth that we proclaim. Father, Spirit, give us the strength to put off the old self and clothe ourselves with the new self. Pray that you help us give us, I pray that you help us give up our time, our energy, our resources. That's all given to you, from you. And help us to give that to your kingdom. Starting with this local believers, of, local body of believers. Help us to be generous and hospitable so that when people outside of this church they look into here, they, they don't just see a club of people, but they see ultimately you. Lord, we love you. 
Help us to do all you've instructed because you love us so dearly and we belong to you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.